Hello. In late 2020, I found out that I was pregnant and I lost my job in tech in the same two weeks. I would not recommend it to anyone. So if you've ever been pregnant, you'll know as exciting as it is to be starting a family, you know, that gut-wrenching fear of what does this mean for my work? So, you know, as a woman, will I be passed over for a promotion? Will I be sidelined in the office? How much maternity leave can I afford to take? Or in my instance, I was thinking, how will we provide for a family at all? So I hardly told anyone, I told my parents and a couple of close friends, but I was so terrified that it would jeopardize my chances of finding another job. So while growing a baby, I applied for 102 jobs and I got rejected for 101 of them. I still have the spreadsheet actually to, to prove it. Um, I did around 40 job interviews during this time, obviously you know, keeping, keeping it a secret that I was pregnant. And so joining these video calls, I put my smart shirt on, get my flashcards, bright smiles. Um, but I think I was, because I was so scared that they might know that I was pregnant, they would somehow find that out, even though it's you know, on a video call, they can't see my stomach. And I think I was just seeping desperation and I just wasn't getting anywhere. And because my job is, it feels like very much part of my identity. So if I don't have a job, then who am I? And overall, it was a really demoralizing time, actually. And I think I lost sight of what value I have to offer. I was genuinely confused about sort of who I am and what I'm good at. And the one job I did get offered was a freelance position. And I did actually take it and I enjoyed it, but I couldn't see past that I need to go full time in order to have a baby. So I really felt like I'd failed on that front. And I was still applying for jobs when I was eight and a half months pregnant. The other thing that happened when I was eight months pregnant is that uh, a close friend died unexpectedly and that left all of us reeling. Um, it was a time of, there was a lot of emotional upheaval and obviously I was hormonal because I was eight months pregnant. Um, it was really quite a tricky time and you get told in kind of hypnobirthing and all this stuff, you need to have a sort of happy, calm, safe environment to bring this baby into. And I just felt like I was bringing a baby into complete chaos but you know, did, did what I could to kind of get in the zone for having a baby, even though, you know, who knows what that's going to be like. And as it turns out, it's completely overwhelming, confusing. Becoming a parent is, you know, it is amazing, but it, it, is, it is overwhelming. Um, I found it a lot. Both, both of us found it a lot. Uh, well, the, the three of us, I suppose, <laughs> found it a lot. And um, <laughs> the other thing about new parenthood, and you're not supposed to say this, especially as a woman, is that it can be quite boring. Um, <laughs> So lots of nappy changes, lots of washing, bulk ordering breast pads on Amazon is boring. And also at the sort of potato stage of um, babies, they're not giving much back. So it, you do crave something else to think about. Um, just anything except the baby. Um, no offense to my baby. But um, because they also just demand to be physically on you at all times. So whether it's kind of feeding, sleeping, they want to be physically on you. So at baby in one arm, my phone in the other hand, and just scrolling sometimes for hours at a time, reading online. And my interest was piqued by the metaverse and NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, and cryptocurrency and blockchain. And I was just like, what is this stuff? And I felt like, okay, the, the tech gods are giving me a sign here. This is how I'm going to future-proof myself, go and find a new job. I need to work in the metaverse. Didn't really know what I was looking for, but I, and actually I could have found something a lot worse in this quite desperate period, I could have sort of stumbled into a complete cult. Maybe I did actually. Um, but, um, but what I did find was this kind of burgeoning internet community called Web3, and I just found it completely intoxicating. So I'll give you a quick internet history lesson. Web 1.0, just the, the dawn of the internet, was you know the World Wide Web, still the internet as we know it today. Uh, websites, emails, slightly limited functionality in terms of what we can do compared to you know, today. Web 2.0 was the next major phase of innovation. So probably around 2004 onwards is when we started seeing the major social media platforms, the sharing economy, so things like Airbnb, Uber, basically apps on our phone that connected us up in a very different way than just the sort of basic Web 1.0. So Web 3.0, which uh, sort of took my interest, is a more uh, sort of it's a, like a community-owned internet. That's the intention of it, is that it's sort of putting power back into the hands of the people, giving you ownership of your own data, um, using blockchain technologies, which I'm going to come to because I know that I've started using a lot of jargon already. And the more I read about this stuff, the more it just blew my mind and I got completely obsessed. Um, probably, <coughs> probably ignored my baby, but it's fine. He's 
he's still around to tell the tale. Um, <laughs> he's, he's crypto native now. Um, but um, so blockchain is um, something that I used to find really dry, actually, when I worked in tech PR about eight years ago. And I couldn't really understand the use case for it. I would read these kind of 3,000 word essays about what blockchain is. I, I couldn't get into it. This time around, I understood it as the kind of building blocks for all these other technologies that sit on top of it. And uh, so if blockchain is this kind of distributed, uh, publicly available ledger of data, so think of like a sort of accounting ledger of lines and lines of information. They are, uh, in, instead you've got uh, blocks of data onto a chain. And because all these network of peer-to-peer -peer computers around the world have to hold identical copies of the same information and agree on any changes, it's like a sort of spreadsheet that's owned and run by the people. So that started to sort of come to life to me more, as did cryptocurrency, which is cash that lives on the blockchain. It's just, it's digital money, and you don't need a bank or an intermediary to move your money. There's no government oversight. I think that's why some people are getting excited about it. But um, it's a sort of fundamentally different way of doing things. And then NFTs, for me, is where things started getting more interesting. Um, they are non-fungible tokens, although what the F is fungible, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but um, NFTs, for me, provided a consumer use case for blockchain, aka why would normal people do anything blockchain-based? Um, and that's because there are digital belongings. So when you buy something physical at the moment, like say buy jeans, a pair of shoes, you know that they're yours, that, you know, the brand isn't going to sort of rescind them, in, like take them back in some way, um, and you could sell them afterwards if you wanted to, they're, they're your own belongings. But things like the messages on your phone, the files in your Dropbox or Google Drive, anything like that, we think of it as being our own, but actually it, it belongs to big tech companies. So NFTs provide a sort of alternative to that, which is that once an NFT, this token, is in your crypto wallet, you own it completely. You can own a piece of the internet. It can't be rescinded by that company. Um, it's totally yours to keep. And an NFT might give you membership. It might be sort of membership to a community. It might be a piece of digital art. It might offer you some, some kind of real-life perks. It almost acts as like a sort of voucher. Or it might prove ownership to something like, it could be your house deeds could be an, a non-fungible token. So the more use cases I learned about, the more I kind of thought, okay, yeah, I can really see why other people are getting excited about this. DAOs were something else that caught my attention. Decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, I know there's yeah, a lot of jargon. I don't know who comes up with this stuff. Um, they make it sound so much more boring than it is. Um, but a uh, DAO is like a sort of cooperative that is on the blockchain. So uh, think of like a company without a boss. Everybody has tokens where they can vote on decisions together. Where it might be sort of funding something new or building a new tech product together. <clears throat> and then the, finally, the metaverse is a sort of 3D internet where, in theory, you'll be able to use these other technologies that you might be able to sort of wear your digital avatars, NFTs, move them between different virtual worlds, and I'm starting to lose people here, but just know that this stuff is coming and it's going to start feeling much more normal. Um, so I also had the Web3 overwhelm, definitely. Um, there was a kind of a period where I could barely sleep, which was quite badly timed with having a young baby, but it just felt so exciting. I felt like I was taking a degree in the space of a month, reading white papers about Bitcoin and blockchain and talking to other Web3 obsessives on Discord, which is like a sort of glorified AOL chat room, if you're old enough to remember those. Um, and um, alongside my excitement, I was feeling it that was very jargon heavy. And there's a lot of slang, actually, because it's this kind of special community. And for example, everybody says GM to each other all the time. It just means good morning. Um, but it's the kind of universal Web3 greeting. There's also things like when Lambo, which is when am I going to get my Lamborghini because I've made so much money on my NFTs and crypto. Um, so I know it all feels quite silly, but that is also an element of, sort of gatekeeping and excluding of like, you know, you're either in the club or you're not in that club. And I could also see there were hardly any women in this club. And that kind of did feel, it did concern me and I didn't feel represented in this space and knew that I wanted to change that somehow. Um, and actually, to be honest, a couple of years later, that's still kind of the case. Women are very much in the minority. Unlike historically male-dominated industries, Web3 is so new, I mean, blockchain's been around for about 10 years, but Web3 generally is this brand new thing. Most of you probably hadn't really heard of it before today, and so it shouldn't be completely male-dominated already. We haven't got decades or centuries of like, well, it's always been this way, there's you know, nothing we can do. This is brand new. So 
if Web3 is supposed to be a utopian vision for a democratized internet in the hands of everybody, then it's not really answering on that. It's not really working for 50% of the population. And I, find that, I do find that concerning. We are on the brink of a major technological revolution, and I think women risk being left behind. Now, alongside the overwhelm, you might also see in the media that it feels like Web3 is maybe just a fad. There's a lot of skepticism and cynicism around these technologies. Sometimes that, that's not unwarranted, but there are some real, really brilliant use cases, and this technology is sticking around. We're going to see wider adoption of a lot of this technology. Over the next five to ten years, I think it's going to be much more normal to be using these things. Things like, you know, you'll have an NFT as like your insurance policy, or uh, there's any number of things. You won't be thinking like, right, now I'm going to sort of uh, participate in a DAO, or a, you know, and now I'm in the metaverse. In the same way as now you don't think, right, I'm online now. We don't sort of see it as distinct in that way. However, there is a risk that this utopian vision could be more of a dystopian nightmare, I think, because things like the sky-high prices of NFTs and cryptocurrencies is prohibitively expensive for the majority of people. So it's not accessible. And you've also got, then got a lack of women, a lack of female founders. So nine out of 10 Web3 startups don't have any women at all on their founding team. And there's also an always-on culture, whether you're talking about the consumers and community or people actually running these businesses. And either way, it can lead to burnout. I know you might be thinking, why does any of that matter? Are we not just talking about buying JPEGs on the internet and wearing VR goggles? It is quite easy to trivialize tech, but I think the long-term impact of this is going to be non-trivial because the businesses being built today are going to be the unicorns of tomorrow. They're going to be the sort of Facebook, Twitter, etc. of tomorrow. I really believe that. If tech is supposed to be about augmenting the human experience, if you start having those issues at that micro level, when those businesses scale, those problems are going to be magnified. And I think AI, artificial intelligence, is going to have a role to play there. It's adding fuel to the fire. Or actually, I see it as kind of like caffeine, which is sometimes it just helps you do stupid things faster. <laughs> and but that's what it does for me anyway. Um, but we are at this quite important inflection point at the moment. I think it mirrors the dot-com boom as well. <clears throat> so if we had the dot-com boom and subsequent crash, we did still ultimately adopt those technologies. They stuck around, and sort of large businesses came out of that. And I think we've got a sort of equivalent happening at the moment. We're in this sort of MySpace and Bebo era, and we will see the next Facebook, Twitter, etc. You know, Airbnb, Uber. We're going to see all of that. And those are the sort of tiny businesses making decisions today, building, uh, sort of building in private, in public, whatever. And if you think about all those decisions that they're making hundreds, thousands of decisions that they're making just on video calls, in cafes, meetings, etc. And who is making those decisions? Is it going to be the same quite homogenous group of people that were making the internet of today and all of those decisions? Is there maybe an opportunity to change that? Because when you look at Web2 today, or Big Tech, which is, nobody would call themselves Web2, but Big Tech today, um, there are some solutions being brought in um, to address inclusion, but those are to address yesterday's problems that have caught up with us. So what we need to be doing, we shouldn't be fixing things after the fact, we should be thinking about those solutions now. Can we start planning tomorrow's solutions today? I knew that as an individual, I only represent one facet of diversity, or you know, I, I can't represent all of it, and I also can't fix the whole internet. But I knew that the lack of women part was something I could start to address. So while I had my small baby, um, I was registering a domain name. I was jumping on Twitter spaces at two in the morning while doing nappy changes. It actually quite worked quite well with having awkward sleeping hours. Um, and started educating other women about Web3 and created a bit of a movement around it. So I was hearing from other women that they were finding the the jargon and the technology quite overwhelming, so I created educational resources. I could see there was a lack of women in Web3 startups and scale-up businesses, so I created a jobs platform. And I was also hearing from women that they wanted to connect with each other, to sort of ask each other questions and learn together, so I put on events. I also knew that if I was going to get this many women into Web3, you have to make sure it's good when they get there. So we've been starting to work with other sort of larger Web3 companies and other big brands to do what we can to build thoughtfully for what comes next and start to build with inclusion in mind. So I'd like to ask you to reimagine the internet. 
We could have a decentralized internet, which puts ownership of your data back into your own hands. It'll be a more immersive internet with the dawn of the metaverse, which will free us from the sort of rectangular screens of today. And hopefully a fairer internet, where the diversity of people building the products at every level should be re representative of the amazing diversity of people using the products, because technology should be in the hands of everybody. If you think about things that you don't like about the internet today, I see Web3 as a chance to rebuild the internet from the ground up. So what should we be doing to build a better internet and hopefully avoid dystopia? Um, we should be getting rid of jargon. I know I keep mentioning this, but it is so excluding and intimidating if, you, if you're outside of this area. And so we should be breaking down the acronyms, explaining the use cases of why is any of this technology actually interesting or beneficial to humans? rather than sort of trying to explain it in terms of like how amazing this revolutionary blockchain technology is, because that makes people switch off. Learning about emerging technologies is a way of future-proofing yourself, as, as it was for me. And so we should be able to give everybody access and the ability to do that. Secondly, we need to make Web3 work for parents. Um, at the moment, the, we need to be de-risking careers for women, especially in this space, because they are sort of chronically underrepresented. It shouldn't be the norm to be online for every time zone um, and sort of, yeah, if crypto never sleeps, well, neither do babies and neither do the, their parents. So it's, it is leading to a lot of burnout. It's, it's, it's not working well at the moment, I would say. And connected to that, very few startups and scale-ups have a parental leave policy in place. And so anyone that dares to get pregnant is going to be negotiating on behalf of everyone that comes after that. Women do risk being left behind in the next technological revolution but I would say it's not too late to change that if we act now. Back in 2020, I was feeling desperate. I was feeling like I was out of options, but if I hadn't got to that point, I wouldn't have fallen down the Web3 rabbit hole. And I'm so glad that I did, because today I've got two toddlers in my life. I've got my baby and I've got my business. We're turning a profit. We're educating thousands of women and doing what we can to make it work better for everybody. So now is our chance to reimagine the web differently and better than Web2, the internet of today. So it's time to build a more equitable internet. Thank you. <laughs>